Tonight we are studying Parashat Bamidbar, and we're going to learn the holy words of Bari Leib Haman, Zechar Tzadik Livracha. And Reb Leib this evening is analyzing the beginning of this week's Torah portion, the book of Bamidbar, right at the beginning, where the Torah, or really God, has the Jewish people counted for the third time so far. Take a look at your screen. Here we go. Numbers chapter 1 verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the Sinai desert in the tent of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after the exodus from the land of Egypt, saying, what did he tell the Jewish people? What did he tell Moses to do for the Jewish people? Chapter 1, verse 2. Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, by families following their father's houses, a head count of every male according to the number of their names. In essence, Hashem is telling Moshe Rabbeinu to count the Jewish people. Now, Rashi addresses, well, why would Hashem want to count the Jewish people again. He counted them not long ago, just seven months ago. We'll soon get into the depth of that. Hashem says, this is based on based on Rashi, that Hashem is counting the Jewish people again because he loves them so much. Something that you love, you keep dear to you, you make sure it's always there, you keep counting it. This is a concept we find over and over in our Torah, that Hashem treats us as, as dear and close and precious pearls. So he keeps on counting us. And Rashi says this is the third time he counts the Jewish people. The first time when, they, we left the Jew, when we left Egypt. Second time is after the sin of the golden calf. And third time is now by the inauguration of the tabernacle. Three times. That's what Rashi says. And now Reb Leib goes and he explains when exactly these three times were. And more specific, how many Jews were we each time? So... The first time is when we left Egypt. Take a look at your screen. Chapter 12 in the book of Exodus, verse 37. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. How many were they? They were 600,000 men between the ages 20 to 60, and that is besides the women and children. 600,000, all right? Between ages 20 and 60. We make a rough estimate that there is around 3 million Jews that actually left Egypt, because if you take all the children under 20 and all the men that were over 60, plus you double that because there are women involved as well, you have an approximate number of 3 million, give or take. It's a lot of people. Second time the Jews are counted in the Torah is by the sin of the golden calf, which refers Reblaib to exactly six months after the Jewish people left. What would we assume if there's 600,000 men when they leave Egypt? Should they be more or less Six months later, more. And you're right, guess what? You're correct. Take a look at your screen. Exodus chapter 30, verse 12. Ki rosh b'nei Yisrael ifkudehem v'natinu ish kofer nafsho l'ashem bifkodotam v'lo yebahem negev bifkodotam. How many are they going to be when they count them? This is the one. Chapter 30, verse 13. What did the Jewish people have to do after the sin of the golden calf? They had to bring half a shekel. That half a shekel was used to atone for the golden calf, but also so that they should be counted. Here's the machatzita shekel. What was this for? This was for truma l'ashem, a donation to Hashem. Now, at the end of Parashat Pikudeh, how many Jews were there? 
chapter 38, verse 25 in Exodus. ha'edam kikar. How many was it? Ve'elef u'shvamot v'chamishim v'shiv'im shekel b'shekel ha'kodesh. That's how many, how many coins they actually counted. 1,000, sorry, uh, 100, 1,000, 1,775 uh, shekels in weight. How many did that actually uh, correspond to in people? That's the next verse, verses Chapter 38, verse 26. Uh, Here we go. Six So there was an increase of 3,500 men between ages 20 and 60 from the time they left Egypt six months later till the day after Yom Kippur. Again, on the day of Yom Kippur, Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Mount Sinai. He came down and he was forgiven and he told the Jewish people they were forgiven for the golden calf. Next day, he says, we're collecting machatzit shekel. How many, how many does he count in the end? 603,550. So there was an extra 3,550 Jews that were taken taken account for. Now fast forward, says Reb Leib, he's explaining Rashi, seven months. Fast forward seven months, fast forward seven months to where the Jewish people are being counted for the third time, and that's the beginning of this week's parsha. The beginning of the service of the, of the Mishkan went after it was inaugurated. Another half shekel was collected then. Take a look at your screen. This is in Bamidbar chapter 1, verse 46. It says as follows. After they were all counted, guess what? How many were there? 603,550. Interesting. So you're telling me that in seven months, there was no increase in number at all. So let's just recap the three times. And then the, the Reb Leib has two questions. First time they were counted is when they left I I Egypt, 600,000. Then after the sin of the golden calf and they were, they, were, they were forgiven, this was the day after Yom Kippur, 603,550. Seven months after that, right a month after the inauguration, the first of the second month, Right? First of Nisan in 2449 is when the inauguration of the Mishkan took place. What happened a month later? A month later was when we, they were counted for the first time. So the first of Iyar in 2449. How many are they? Same number as seven months ago. 603,550. Question number one. Why is it, Reb Leib asks, why did Hashem to wait to count the Jewish people a month after the, 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 the tabernacle was inaugurated? His Shekhinah resided already from the first of Nisan in the Mishkan. Count the Jews then. Why are you waiting to count a month later? Question number two, the obvious question. How is it possible that it took seven months later and the same amount of Jews are there? The previous six months, there was an influx. And now the next seven months, none at all? How could it be? You're telling me that there was no Jews that turned 20 in the meantime? So Rashi gives an answer. Rashi's answer is that the way we count the age, or the way the age was counted here, was based on the year and not on a person's birthday. So anyone that will turn 20 within the next year is already considered 20 and they were already counted from Rosh Hashanah, right? Yom Kippur, it's right after Rosh Hashanah. They were already counted then. Since they were already counted then, whoever's going to turn 20 within the next year was already counted. So when you count them, seven months later, it's the same amount of people. 
That's Rashi's answer. Nachmanides disagrees. Nachmanides, he asks, he, he says, Rashi, when do we ever see that we count the person's age based on the Rosh Hashanah? No. If your birthday is a certain date, that's when you turn whatever it is you're turning. That's it. You don't you don't count you don't count a birthday based on the year. Every year Rosh Hashanah a person no, it's on your birthday. Your birthday's on Purim, your birthday's on Pesach, your birthday's on Shavuot, whatever is your birthday, that's when your new that's when your age changes. So he says, I don't think that that makes too much sense. And furthermore, just looking at this one second. He says a different answer. The Ramban says, the reason why the third counting was the same number as the second counting of the Jewish people is clear to him. He says it's because the Levites were not counted in the third counting. So the first counting and the second counting was the entire nation. There's an influx. But now you're counting the third time 11 out of 12 tribes. And it happens to be the exact same number, but minus a tribe. Minus the tribe of Levi. He proves it from a verse right here. Chapter 1, verse 49 in Bamidbar. Achet mate levi lotif kod. Vet rosham lotisa bitoch b'nei Israel. Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu. Do not count the tribe of Levi. Levi is not to be counted amongst the Jewish people. So the 603,550 now only include 11 out of the 12 tribes. So the amount of Levites that are missing happen to actually be the amount of Jews that turned from 19 to 20 over the past six, uh, over the past seven months. And that's why it's equal. So the Or Chaim HaKadosh says, based on this Ramban, he answers our first question. He says, you know why Hashem had to wait till Iyar to count and not Nisan? It's because at the first of Nisan, there wasn't the total amount of men, which is 22,000 Levi'im that were not being counted now. There was not 22,000 men that turned 19 to 20. They needed that extra month so that it would offset and be the exact same number. Interesting. I'll show you the verse that tells us this. Here we go. Bamidbar chapter 3 verse 39. 22,000. So, so what did we, what, what's the Rachaim saying? The reason why Hashem waited till Iyar to count the Jewish people and not back in Nisan, he had to wait an extra month so that it would equal that very same number. And he also says that the entire time the Jewish people, right, we can ask, well, what happened to any casualties? Didn't anyone pass away? Not really, because the entire time the Jewish people were involved in the construction of the Mishkan, not one Jew passed away. Not even one. He proves this based on a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 4. You who are clung, cleave to, the, to Hashem, your God. You are alive, all of you today. The, uh, the, the Midrash tells us that the entire time the Jewish people were, were in the middle of building the Mishkan, not one Jew died. Because they were all clinging to Hashem in a very strong and powerful way. So now, Reb Leib challenges the Orachayim HaKadosh. He challenges this, this explanation and he says, Why is it that the second and third counting have to be the same number? Let Hashem count and let it be a different number. In Parashat Pinchas, which we're going to read in, I don't know, let's say two months from now. Less even. In Parashat Pinchas, when the Jews are counted for a fourth time, the number is completely different. 
Why is it that the second and third counting have to be the same number? That's one question of Blaib asks. Another question he says, how is it a proof that no one died during these seven months if the number is the same? That doesn't prove anything. How do I know that no one died? It just We could just say that there was many, many 19 year olds that turned 20 and some also died. How is that a proof that there was a, a swap for 22,000 and 22,000? Furthermore, Reb Leib says that we've learned before in this class that the um, construction of the Mishkan only took place for 72 days. It stopped on the 25th of Kislev, which is well amount of time before, a couple months before Nisan and before Iyar. So even if you say that no one was dying while they were in the middle of constructing the Mishkan, Mishkan was finished being built on the 25th of, of, of Kislev. In the meantime, there could have been casualties. So again, it doesn't make sense. Why is it pushed off to ER, explains Rebleib. And also, how's Rashi going to explain this? Why does Rashi, who says that everyone was counted from Rosh Hashanah if they're going to be turning 20 in the next year, they were already counted. How does he explain why Hashem did not count the Jewish people on Rosh Chodesh Nisan and rather he counted them on the first of Iyar a month late? So Reb Leib says that on Nisan in truth, the first of Nisan was a sad day. That was the day that Nadav and Aviyu passed away. And that was a day that the entire Jewish nation, including Moshe and Aaron, were preoccupied with that. It wasn't it was a happy time, but it was bittersweet. And therefore, it wasn't the time to count them. And that could be an explanation why there was a delay. But he gives it something even deeper. And this answer, Rebleib says, this is not my words, that it's something so fundamental and important that we need to know. And this concept is found in the Sforno. The Sforno is an Italian chacham, great commentary on our Torah, and he writes on the second verse of this week's Torah portion, which I'll share with you again so you can follow along nicely. It says that... Oh, one second. Okay. It, Moshe is commanded to by God. Se'u et rosh koladat b'nei Yisrael mishpochotam levet avotam. Take a num, count, take a sum of the congregation of all the children... By the number of names, you'll make a head count. Asks the Sforno, by the number of names? Since when do we call people by the, do we count people by their names? We call people by their names, but since when do we count people by their names? We count them by people. The Sforno says it should say, Bimispar Anashim. By counting people, not by counting names. Explains the Sforno, a very deep and fundamental concept that each and every Jew at that time was finally identified by their individual name. When they were counted this time, they all had a specific, unique identification. So the Sforno is very shorthanded. Reb Leib at length explains what the Sforno is really telling us. And he says this is a concept that is based on something that we see in the beginning of the Torah. We see that Adam was the one who went and named every single living being. Take a look at your screen. Genesis chapter 2 verse 19. Vayitzer Hashem Elokim min ha'adama kol chayat hasadeh. Vet kolof hashamayim. Hashem formed from the earth every beast in the field and every fowl in the heavens. Vayavo el ha'adam lirot ma'ikralo. And he brought all of these living beings to Adam to see what he's going to call them. V'chol asher ikralo ha'adam nefesh chaya hu shemo. And Adam was the one who decided and called every single animal by name. And that's how they're going to be called even in the future. Forevermore, Adam was given a God gift of wisdom to look at every creature, understand their essence. In Hebrew, the word is mahut. To understand their essence, 
and name them accordingly, forming up a word that is comprised of the holy Hebrew letters of Lashon HaKodesh. For example, the very famous one, Kelev. Chaf, Lamed, Bet. Why is a dog called a dog in Hebrew a Kelev? Kelev means like a heart. Because dogs are great companions for human beings. I'm not saying that you should have a dog at home. That's another concept, another talk. We've spoken about that before. Dogs were literally the shepherd's helpers and companions outside of the house, if you catch my drift. But we're not going to speak about that now. However, every single letter and every single word that the animals were named was a divine wisdom of Adam. That was He was able to identify their essence and bring out their characteristics and essence based on how, they would, how he would name them. The Talmud says in Masechet Brachot, page 7b, that a person's name says a lot, explains a lot about the person's essence and tendencies to the point where parents have a small form of prophecy when they decide to name their child a certain name. Names have a tremendous impact on a person, but it's more than that. It's not that the name has an impact on the person. The person has an impact on their name because the name explains who they are. The majority, Reb Leib says, of Jews, unfortunately, are not able to identify their own essence and their mission in life. There's only one way to do so. It's by clinging to Hashem through learning His Torah and finding a Rebbe that knows you, that can help you and guide you to fulfill your mission, to understand your essence and your tendencies and your characteristics about you. That's the only way that it can be done. Now our blade goes to the Jews that left Egypt and he says, this generation... We refer to them as the Dor Dea, the generation of knowledge. They were greatly influenced by a Moshe, a Haron, and the elders. In a very powerful way, they were influenced. When the Shekhinah, when Hashem resided his own essence and presence in the Mishkan on the first of Nisan, Hashem resided also in each and every Jew. As the Torah says, Vishachanti Betocham. Hashem resided in them, in them, in every single Jew. Hashem was with each and every Jew. But the Jews still didn't understand themselves. It was a new phenomenon to them. They didn't understand their identity or their name yet. But a month later, a month of living that way with Hashem in them, part of them, 30 days later, they finally understood. After being exposed for 30 days to Hashem's light, now they were able to understand their essence and their name. Their unique and individual special self, mission and goal in life. An identity that you only have just as you are the only one that carries your name. You, your last name, your parents' names, unique that way. The Jewish nation, Reb Leib says, we have to understand is not just a group of people that all come from the same forefathers, that all worship the same God, that all study the same Torah. That's true. But more importantly, we are a group of unique individuals with great spiritual capabilities and a mission to accomplish. Only at the first of Iyar, a month after Hashem inaugurated, when the, the tabernacle was inaugurated and Hashem came there for the first time, a month later, 30 days is something which changes something from being temporary to permanent. For example, the reason why we don't put a mezuzah on our sukkah is because it's a temporary structure. And when you move into a house, you have 30 days to put up a mezuzah. 
Because 30 days make something permanent. After 30 days of being permanent with Hashem, the Jews finally understood themselves, their own role, their own name. And that's why Hashem tells Moshe, count them bemispar shemot. Not bemispar anashim, not numbering men or people, numbering by their name, count them by name. Because every Jew is unique and every Jew has a role and a mission and something to contribute towards mankind. Another similar concept is that every single Jew that stood at Mount Sinai, we received the Torah collectively, but we also received the Torah individually. Now, what I mean by that, Chazal explained, our sages teach us, that we all received all 613 mitzvot all at once, the written and the oral Torah as a group. But the connection to the Torah, each and every one of us has a unique individual connection and has something, at least one thing, that you have that you can reveal to the world and explain. It could be a question, it could be an answer, it could be a question and an answer, it could be multiple things, but there's at least one thing that each and every Jew has to offer to develop the Torah to the rest of the world that no other Jew has. Again, it could be a question, an interpretation, an answer, an explanation, something. We each have our own chelek. We're going to read, we're going to say in the prayers over the holidays, V'ten chelkenu betoratecha. We pray to Hashem, give us our portion of Torah. Our portion? Yes, we each have a different portion. One person's going to come up with the most fag- fantastic question on why Hashem did something this way or why the Torah says it this way. And someone else is going to come up with an answer that no one else has had. This is our chalik, our portion. We're never allowed to refer, we're never supposed to refer to people only as a group. There's a lot of power that uh, is attributed to a group and unity and minds coming together, obviously stronger together than rather than alone. But beyond that is recognizing the identity and the individuality of each and every participant. Just like one's children or one's grandchildren. You could have so many of them, but they all have a special place in your heart. Over the past two weeks, the entire Jewish nation has been hit with very, very harsh, horrible things. That which happened in Meron, that's what's happening. That which is happening over the past 48 hours, the rockets being fired into civilian cities. I remember years ago when I lived in Israel, I remember the feeling of the sirens being sounded, running to the shelters. It's not a pleasant feeling. It's something which not everyone has experienced. It's something scary. But when we realize, of course, we come together as a group and it's happening to a group, but the individuals that are being hurt, that were hurt, or the casualties of those individuals, every individual is a world. And unfortunately, every Jew that is lost is a world that is lost. So, of course, we mourn the passing and the hardship and and the lack of safety collectively. But we should also focus on those individuals, the individuals that were lost, individuals that need a refresh lima, something that we should really lend our hearts out to and not discount anyone. 
and not just group people up and put them all together because they either look the same or sound the same or do the same things. Every single person is an individual. They have a unique purpose and mission. They have their own portion in the Torah. And there's someone special. So let us also ask Hashem, in the marriage of Ari Leib Haman, the merit of all the great tzaddikim, that we should find within studying the Torah and the guidance of our Rebbe, our essence, our tendencies, our traits, our character, our things that we need to work on and the things that we're great at, and our mission, and hope to bring that mission to fruition in our lifetimes, very soon, hopefully, there will be a, hopefully no more lack of clarity, that we have a clear goal, clear destination. And remember, your goal and destination and mission is different than mine and different to the person next to you, different than your spouse and different to everyone else. Of course, we have all common goals, but there's something specific that you were put on this earth for. Seek it out and bring it and make it a reality. Thank you for joining us. All right, if anyone has any questions, now would be a great time. Just a comment. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you. It was really, really awesome. I love the way you tied it in with, um, with the fact that every person, every Jew has a chilek of Torah. And um, if you remember, we spoke about it last week that I mentioned that there's an incoming of Chochmah to a specific person that is just theirs. So it's similar to what you just said, that they have that chidush, that they can give over. And so that's why we have to give each other respect and kavod and listen when someone has something to say about Torah and, uh, and Torah wisdom. So thank you very much for sharing. That was beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chodesh Tov, everyone. Chodesh Chodesh Sameach. Tov. We're missing a couple of our regulars, but we have a lot of newcomers. So uh, welcome to all the newcomers. And uh, it was a, a pleasure to learn all together tonight. And hope to see you again next week. Bezrat Hashem. Bezrat Hashem. Wonderful.